Hello everyone, my name is Eriko Nunes. I'm one of the developers working on the Lima graphics driver, and I'm going to present the Lima driver status update 2021. The last time we did a presentation about Lima was about two years ago in XCC 2019, but back then the driver was still not fully functional. We were still working on some basic functionality, and a lot has changed since then. There have been many, many improvements to Lima, which is why I wanted to bring this new status update. So the presentation starts with an overview about Lima and then a recap about Mali 400. Uh, then I have the status update where I went back to see what were some of the more relevant work that happened since our last presentation. Uh, then I go over a uh, benchmark, which I think has some uh, interesting results. And then I would like to open a discussion about how do we go forward from this point. So Lima is an open source graphics driver for the Mali 400 series of GPUs from ARM. It's done via reverse engineering. The, the Lima project has actually started a long time ago and there's a lot of history. And I'm not going to go over all of that history again here. We did go over this uh, in our previous presentation. So when I'm talking about Lima here, I'm talking about the version that exists uh, in upstream today in Mesa since 19.1 and the Linux kernel since the kernel 5.2. And Lima today exists as a fairly standard open source driver. Uh, in Mesa, it uses the Gallium infrastructure, the near infrastructure for, for the compilers, uh, in the Linux kernel, it's a standard DRM driver, so it's a, it's a pretty standard open source uh, driver like uh, all of the other ones that exist today. It is a fully community developed driver, which means that everyone that's working on it is working uh, as part of the community and there are no, uh, as far as I know, developers who are full-time employed or dedicated to working on Lima. And I think it's important to keep this in mind because it has implications on, for example, how much time or effort we have to invest in this. Uh, these are a um, little bit of stats about the GPU itself, not necessarily uh, all about Lima. So the original Mali 400 GPU came out in 2008. There were earlier models that came before that that are uh, related to it, but I'm not going to consider here, just considering from the Mali 400 what came after that. Then there's the Mali 450, which is uh, mostly similar, but that there are some differences, especially in, in submitting jobs to the hardware, but it's pretty similar. Uh, and then there's the Mali 470, which is newer, but much less popular than the other two. In fact, there hasn't been a lot of interest in, in it uh, recently. Uh, it's not even supported by Lima at this point, just because nobody really uh, seems to care much about it. Now, ARM claims it to be one of their world's most shipped mobile GPUs. And I believe at some point in the past decade, uh, that was uh, the most shipped mobile GPU. And you can still find it today uh, in some single board computers, maybe some lower end tablets, uh, set top boxes, or, or, or these types of devices. It's, it targets mostly OpenGL ES2. Uh, that's what the binary driver from ARM supports, also OpenGL ES 1.1, but no desktop OpenGL support unless you do some sort of compatibility layer on top, uh, which we do get in, in Lima because of the Mesa uh, layer that allows, it to, allows us to expose desktop OpenGL. Uh, the GPU is a tiling rendering model, which is pretty common in other mobile or embedded types of GPUs, not only the, the Mali uh, series of, of GPUs. This uh, is important to keep in mind if you're targeting applications for the Mali GPU, uh, because there are some things you should uh, not do uh, uh, you, that could affect the 
performance of your application on a tiling rendering model. There are also some things that you can do to exploit this model to improve performance and reduce power consumption. So it's something to keep in mind when, when targeting an application to, to this type of GPU. Uh, the GPU does not have a unified, a unified shader architecture, which means we have different architectures for the vertex shader and for the fragment shader. This shows a little bit of the age of the GPU because pretty much everything that came after this generation came with a unified shader architecture, which means you only have uh, one core that can do both uh, vertex shader and fragment shader, for example. In the case of uh, driver, this has a serious implication because it means we need to maintain two different compilers, one for the vertex shader cores and one for the fragment shader cores. Uh, so that's, um, we have to maintain two compilers. And uh, the hardware may come in different configurations with up to eight fragment shader cores and up to two vertex shader cores. So this will depend on the implementation from the SOC vendor. Um, the cores, they do not support integers, although you can use integers in your shader using uh, the OpenGL shading language. Uh, the only thing that's supported by the GPU is floating point 16 bit. So everything has to be lowered down to 14.16 bit. Even if you use the qualifiers from OpenGL shading language like higher precision or low precision, uh, that will mostly be ignored because the only thing that's supported by the hardware is 14.16 bit. And finally, I, I include this last one because there is often still uh, someone confused about it, but the Mali 400 is a GPU in the sense that it's a 3D accelerator, but it's not a display controller. Every SOC vendor will include a separate uh, display controller or display engine that will depend on, on the vendor. And that is the thing that will be driving this, the, the screen, like an HDMI screen or LCD display. To be able to show the images that are rendered uh, on the GPU, uh, on a screen, uh, there needs to be a communication between the hardware and there needs to be a communication between the drivers, but the Mali GPU itself is not putting the images on the screen. This is something to, to keep in mind when uh, debugging, especially basic enablement of, of the GPU or some newer board. So one thing I wanted to discuss a little bit is uh, this question, is it still relevant today? because someone might make the point, and I think it's uh, it can be a valid point. Uh, the GPU is over 10 years old, so is it uh, still worth it to spend time enabling it and improving it, or is it just trying to enable some uh, legacy or obsolete hardware? So why, why are people still working on this? So from my perspective, it uh, can still be relevant today, at least in some niche applications, which is why, uh, which is what I wanted to showcase here a little bit. Uh, the first one, in case uh, you haven't heard, this this device it's called the Pine Phone, and it's a device that started uh, well, it's a smartphone that started shipping around last year, and it is a Linux phone. Uh, well, it, it it runs Linux, of course. In fact, it runs mainline Linux. But it's different than most other phones in the sense that you can run regular uh, Linux distributions on it. So basically, every distribution that exists for the PC or, or laptop space has been ported to the Pine phone, and you can run an operating system on your phone that will be running, uh, for example, a Wayland compositor, and you can run normal Linux uh, applications on it, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, you can you can choose which distribution you want to to flash on it. For example, there's uh, Manjaro, which I believe is the default one. There's UB ports, which is something that derives from Ubuntu. There's KDE Neon. There are other mobile operating systems like Postmarket OS, which has been ported to the Pine Phone. There's also an Android port uh, for for the Pine Phone. And I think the fact that the Pine Phone exists is it's pretty cool because it greatly increases the number of people who are using Lima today. The other 
uh, application that I like to showcase are these uh, media center or media player types of applications. Uh, we did get a lot of involvement from people who are enabling operating systems for this, uh, for example, on IRC. Um, I think it's an uh, application where the Mali Frontier can still be relevant because most of the work is not being done by the GPU anyway. The GPU is basically compositing the video frames that have been decoded by another piece of hardware, which would be the hardware video decoder on the board. So we don't really need a very powerful GPU to do this. So many of these cheaper single board computers that come with the Mali 450 could still be used for this type of application. And these two uh, applications, the, the people who are working on it have reached out to us a lot, for example, filing GitLab issues that helped us identify problems with the driver or, or on IRC. So I think these are, are some still these are some spaces where there's still interest in, in using uh, the, the Mali 400 series of GPUs. So now onto the status update uh, itself. This is where I went over our Git history and tried to find uh, some of the most notable work that has happened in the past couple of years. Uh, some of it has existed for quite a long time. Uh, but I put it in here anyway because it was never mentioned. The, the first one is uh, the job submission rework, uh, which was pretty important work for Lima. So before that, we basically only had single queue for for a job. So if you do a frame buffer switch, we would always have to flush uh, all of the work that has been queued there. So after this, now we have multiple queues, so you can the driver performs much better in situations where you where you have to switch frame buffers all the time. Uh, there has been also enablement, for example, on partial update and frame buffer invalidation extensions, which are pretty important for the tiling rendering model, like I mentioned before. So all of this is supported in Lima. There has been work on some caches. The, the first one is a cache for buffer objects that has also been there for, for a long time now, you know, so that you don't have to go to the kernel to allocate buffer objects all the time. Uh, there have been shader caches. We actually have two of them now. The first one is the runtime cache, because there are some OpenGL things that you can do that will require shader to be recompiled. One example is that to do the final compilation for the shader, you need to know what are the formats for textures that are currently bound. So if you keep switching that all the time, uh, before we had the, the runtime shader cache, it, there would be a risk that the shaders would be recompiled on every frame. And of course that would be pretty bad. So we have a runtime shader cache and later on, there was also with the pine phone people enabling some very early versions of gtk4 hit a case where the sh some of the shaders were extremely big and they were compiling all of them was taking something in the order of a few seconds every time you would launch an application and of course that's not really great so we did some improvement in, in compiler uh, compilation time but there is also at this cache. So now you can save this compiled uh, shaders to the disk and just load them from, from the cache. There has been a lot of compiler work since then. In fact, by the time we did our previous presentation, uh, the, the shader compilers were not even uh, complete. The, you could not do things like complicated uh, control flow. And this has been supported for, for a long time now for both the Fragment Shader compiler as well as the Vertex Shader compiler. So I would say it's not, not even only complete, but there has also been a lot of work in optimizing. Uh, for example, on the Fragment Shader, uh, one of the things that can be done to optimize for performance is to combine multiple instructions in, into a single one. And there's a, a step in compilation that does this and we improve this a lot so more things can get combined now. There is still work that can be done to improving this like I will mention later 
but the situation today with the compilers, I would say it is um, very stable. We don't have many known uh, very big problems with the compilers. It has been stable for, for quite a long time already. So the compilers are in a, in a good state. There have been lots of uh, bugs fixed. Uh, many of these come from the applications that I mentioned uh, in, in, in the relevant applications before. Uh, I just collected here a few of them, which were the more interesting visual types of glitches. Of course, all of this has been fixed. But going here from left to to right, the first one are some GTK applications that stopped rendering fonts. And this happened because we enabled support for RG textures. And then something in, in Glamour st stopped working because we, we had RG textures, but we didn't support texture swizzling. And that was a little bit tricky to, to figure out. But it's fixed now. Um, the other one, the half GLX gears image was the Glamour HUD. So this never worked, but for some reason, nobody reported it uh, before. Uh, there were a few a few problems with the shaders that, that are used for, for Gallium HUD. Uh, it's fixed now. Then at the bottom, there is this uh, test image that was from when I was doing some work trying to enable them, uh, well, trying to fix some of the cases for the, the video uh, decoding applications. I was trying this uh, Vivid test driver, which is a video for Linux uh, test driver. And the application just showed me that window that was a shader problem that for some reason was also not caught by any other application. So that's also fixed. Then there are a bunch of uh, icons. I believe this is something from UB ports after some of our shader work. And this was actually pretty nice because we were uh, doing this series of patches to improve the fragment shader compiler. And then on the next day, somebody already found some of, of these issues that, that came from that uh, patch set. So people were really trying the latest version every time, which was, which was pretty cool. Then we have the jellyfish. It should uh, not be red like that. There was actually a, a series of problems in, in trying to do video decoding. Uh, in this case, it was related to YUV textures again, like, like the other one from the uh, Vivid driver. Uh, I think those fixes were pretty important because they enabled, uh, well, they fixed many problems that were on the media center types of, of applications and using, for example, imported uh, buffers and imported RG textures to do some video decoding. And yeah, that, that's, uh, I think that was a pretty important fix. And then of course, people wanted to run uh, Super Mario on the, on the Pine phones and that was terribly not working. There was this a pretty bad bug with reusing uh, buffers that contain vertex data. Uh, well, of course, that's also fixed now, but it was it was cool that, that people were, were trying to do that and they reported it very quickly after that port came out. Other than that, uh, there has been some work in documentation. In fact, this this is uh, something that changed in Mesa. There was this documentation rework, I believe, a couple of years ago. And there is this space where there can be uh, driver documentation. So we, we had for quite some time now some external documentation for Lima. Uh, what I did was basically to port that to this new format. And I also wrote this FAQ because well many times people were coming to irc and ask the exact same questions for example when are you going to support opengl3 which is something that we cannot because the hardware has serious limitations for that um, so at least now we have somewhere to point people when they 
come up with those same questions. And I think it, it, it looks pretty nice now, uh, there, together with the, with the other drivers. Uh, I think it makes the driver feel a little bit more official uh, inside the, the set of Mesa drivers. Then we have CI for, for Lima. So we actually had CI the, the for, for the first time uh, over a year ago. People from Colabra and Bay Libre were working on it. And it existed for some time, but then after some point, I, I don't know exactly what happened. The, maybe the hardware stopped working or people didn't have uh, enough time to spend on it anymore, but it was disabled and basically never uh, enabled again. And I had this set of uh, boards that I had the idea to enable a CI pipeline for, for Lima on it. It turns out it's quite challenging to enable hardware. I know there's a later presentation on this XDC on, on this topic, but it, it, it is actually a, a lot of work to enable hardware to be to, to work with the CI that we have today in Mesa. CI, CI that we have in Mesa is great, but for example, I had to learn about, uh, about Lava itself, about how to create and maintain an instance for it. The boards, of course, have to be in a reliable state. They have to use NFS. They have to be power controlled. They have to have a serial port that is accessible by the Lava instance. So, well, another thing is that while well, they are running code from the internet, so if I'm going to allow the boards to do that, they should at least be on a separate network that doesn't have access to the rest of my computers. So there was a lot of work, but it's, uh, officially enabled today again. Uh, it's already running jobs. I'm actually a little bit surprised by how many jobs it's running. I was expecting it would not be running many jobs, but it turns out there are maybe 10 to 15 jobs that run on it per day at this point. Uh, for example, from work that is happening on shared uh, code like in near or in Gallium. So it's pretty cool. I think the boards are getting some, some great use there and it's great feeling that now people can work on the shared infrastructure and not affect Lima. We we did have a, a patch that uh, was submitted to Lima before, but the submitter was not very sure because it didn't have hardware to test. So now this, this should not be a problem anymore. And if you're curious how the Lima CI board farm looks like, it's this stack of boards. Uh, I think the cases are, are Pretty cool the way that you can you can stack them. They are turned off most of the time. They're not uh, running jobs. Um, it's also it also looks a little bit more messy than than this now because I had to add the, the serial connections. Three of them are used as runners, and the last one I used as a control board because you need to have the the serial ports. These boards usually have the serial connectors on the GPIOs, uh, so we need to have a lot of USB ports need to make the serial accessible on the network, for example. So this is what it looks like. Uh, in case anyone else from uh, from the, the Mesa community wants to enable something like that and would like some opinions, I don't know if there are other Lava instances that are not uh, backed by company or something. In my case, I just have my individual Lava instance. If somebody is interested in hearing more about that or my experience, please just uh, uh, reach out on, on IRC. Another thing I wanted to bring for the status update is our uh, the AQP results. So the AQP is the uh, OpenGL, OpenGL ES conformance test from Kronos. Uh, we are currently targeting the, the OpenGL ES2 uh, uh, conformance tests. And it's cool that now I, I don't even have to run it on my own boards anymore like I was doing in the past. I can just copy the results from the latest CI job and, and, and show it here. So we are passing almost 16,000 tests. There are 59 that are still failing as expected. Uh, there are some warns, some skips because it's not supported by the hardware and it doesn't take a lot of time to to run that. 
The expected fails, at least the last time I, I looked more in depth into that, seem to be, at, most of them seem to be related to precision issues. So, for example, just doing a, a texture sample, but one of the pixels comes wrong because, I don't know, it's doing some, some math on texture coordinates and it's falling back to the lower precision. Uh, so none of them seem to be some critical problem that we should uh, treat right away. Uh, we did do a lot of work on this over the past couple of years. So these ones that are remaining, they don't seem to be some urgent issue that, that we need to fix. I should also note here that the, the binary drivers from ARM also have some of these expected fails. In fact, the there are some of those sets that are fixed in Lima. Some uh, some of them fail in Lima, but don't, don't fail on the binary driver. There is a um, small delta there. Uh, maybe that's something we, we, we could look at. But at this point, I believe the results are pretty good. Another thing I wanted to mention in here is, is the situation with Android. Uh, I noticed that there have been uh, great community efforts to enable Android and on devices that have the Mali 400 GPU. Uh, people come out on IRC or on, on GitLab issues as well. Uh, this is actually a picture of my PinePhone running the, the GlowDroid uh, distribution, which is called uh, GlowDroid. And I, I tried it. Uh, recently, and I was actually really surprised by how smooth it feels con considering all of the limitations of, of the hardware. This is, I believe, the latest Android version that has been ported to it. And it, it felt really smooth. I, I tried installing a bunch of applications and games and some benchmarks, and it actually uh, felt much better than, than what I expected. And it seems to be in good shape. Um, it seems that uh, people are doing great work, the, the people who are trying to enable this. Then finally, there is the, the kernel side. In fact, the, the kernel side hasn't changed a lot uh, in the past couple of years. One notable feature that I, I looked back in the history was the runtime power management, which is enabled today and it works. Uh, it's pretty cool. But uh, other than that, most of the patches seem to be about reworks. People are changing something on the shared DRM infrastructure, and then they go and do some cleanups on, on, on Lima as well. Uh, well, the, the kernel side has been pretty stable. Then I have the, the benchmark. And the reason that initially motivated me to do this is because I I found some feedback on the internet. Maybe I, I should not go and look at things like that. But I found some some feedback that people were like saying, well, uh, I had this Android phone 10 years ago and it performed great. How come I have my Pine phone now with this uh, Linux desktop stack and it doesn't feel as smooth? The, Performance should be at least twice as what it is uh, as what I'm seeing, and of course the the only reason why this might be happening must be because of the graphics driver. So the graphics driver should be should should have some problem that is a lower performance to half of what it should be. Uh, this is the kind of performance. Uh, uh, this is the kind of feedback you find if you go look in the the right or the the wrong places, and. So uh, I was wondering how how exactly are we doing because nobody ever showed some numbers or some benchmark like this uh, before. Uh, so when I started doing it, I realized that it's actually not so easy. Maybe that's why people didn't do it before because it's it's hard to find a platform where you can run uh, both the the binary driver from ARM as well as Lima because most of the images for any available boards that you will find will have a kernel like a three point something kernel that is really, really old. And Lima was available since the kernel 5.2. Uh, 
if you find images that are with something with a newer kernel, then it will have Lima, it will not have uh, the Mali driver anymore. The only thing that I found, or the best thing that I found, was uh, the image for the, the same bars that I have in CI. It's a Debian 10 image that has the Mali driver working. I tried to make the Mali driver work with other drivers, but I completely failed at that. Uh, so I just had to use an image that already has the Mali driver working. And then I was able to to use the vendor kernel that they have for it that has Lima, and then I could just delete Ima, Lima from one image and delete the Mali driver from the other image. So I had two images on the same board. I could do the benchmark. And I also included in here a uh, Raspberry Pi 3 with, with the same benchmark. Uh, the, the main reason I'm including it in here is I, I'm definitely not interested in doing a performance contest or comparison or anything. I just wanted to have a reference of another Mesa driver just to see if there would be something off with the numbers, if that would be something that is because of Mesa or because of Lima itself. So it's useful to have another driver and the Raspberry Pi 3 is kind of the same class or generation of, of GPUs. Then I did an application which, which has to be OpenGL ES2 because that's the only thing natively supported by the binary driver. So uh, I just use the GL Mark II benchmark. And yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm really not interested in doing a performance contest. I don't want to claim one driver is better than the other or, or anything like that. What I'm mostly interested here is to see if we missed some important performance optimization or if we have some, if we happen to have some fundamental problem with Lima that is affecting performance in general. So that's the main reason I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, and I'm saying this because I don't want to see an article published somewhere saying that I'm claiming that the driver is X times faster or slower than the other. That's really not my objective here. And also this is just GL Mark II. These are mostly synthetic benchmarks. Uh, if you really want to evaluate if, if Lima is uh, affecting the performance of your application, you should do a, a benchmark with that application. Th these numbers are just representative for, for this particular program. So this is the first chart. Uh, are, these are the results for the standard set of benchmarks um, at 800 by 600 resolution. The first ones I want to comment are the top ones, where it was actually good to see that Lima actually is performing quite well there. You, you even have a high performance uh, using Lima. Uh, of course, these are the, the simplest ones. They are some fairly simple geometry and some, some fairly trivial shaders um, there, but it was cool to see that. I think, I think this uh, already provides uh, an original idea that we we probably don't have any sort of fundamental performance problem with Lima. I want to comment on some of the other ones, but I'm going to jump to the full HD results. The first one I wanted to comment is this uh, shadow benchmark, which is a little bit of an outlier. And I, I went to look into this and it turns out it's because we didn't support 16-bit uh, depth buffers. And it's something that the, the Mali driver supports. Uh, it was actually not completely trivial to enable it. It's not just listing the format in there. You know, I had to go back to reverse engineering a little bit and figure out there's a separate bit that needs to be enabled for 16-bit depth buffers to work. Uh, after enabling that, there was still another problem, which is that the benchmark itself doesn't specify what kind of precision it wants for the depth buffer. So, OpenGL will allow the implementation to choose, and the Mali driver will choose the 16-bit depth buffer, whereas in Mesa, we are defaulting to the 24-bit depth buffer. So even after that, the application will still have an impact on the, on the final performance. If I go and change the benchmark to use 16-bit depth buffer, then I could get a closer result. So, so that was cool to see. Then the effect 2D-2 was really, really interesting. Uh, so, some time ago, we enabled support for some different texture formats that required us to, to modify 
the shaders. And then we're using um, a helper function from Mesa, which will provide the, the swizzles that are expected that you have to apply to the result of the texture sample. It turns out that this benchmark is doing 15 texture samples from an RGB texture, not RGBA, which means well, and what comes from this helper function from ESA is that we force the alpha field to be one. And this might seem harmless. We're just forcing constant one there to, to the alpha field. But it turns out that in, in this case, it has it, it had a pretty big impact. Uh, when you do that, you're changing the result register not to be an SSA anymore. It becomes a register that can be written multiple times. and this makes it miss uh, a lot of uh, optimizations that could happen later on. And it actually ends up doubling the size of, of, of the shader. So that's why the, there is such a big um, performance difference in there. And this is something that we still need to work on. Of course, it's like, exaggerated here because uh, this is doing basically only uh, texture samples. But it, it was an interesting Thing to find out from, from this benchmark. And then the last one I want to comment is loop-3. The difference between the first uh, two loop benchmarks and, and loop-3 is that loop-3 uses, well, it has a loop, but it the condition for it to end comes from a uniform. And the for, for some reason, well, the, the reason this, the, this one in particular is, is interesting is that both the, the VC4 driver and, and Lima seem to do a much worse job at this particular benchmark. And I wanted to see why. At, at first, I thought it's because we are loading the uniform value at every iteration of the loop. That doesn't seem to be the case. I thought the Mali driver was somehow figuring out the, the bounds of the loop and, and rolling it. Uh, but it also doesn't seem to be the case. Although the shader in the Mali driver for, for this benchmark is much, much more optimized. Uh, I'm still not sure what's the case for this one, but I'll, I think we should look into that. Yeah, so going back here, the, there are many, many other ones that we, sh we, we could take a look at. I, w I wanted to know here uh, which ones of, of these benchmarks are ones that are affected only because of the shader size, uh, which I believe is the explanation for, for many, many of these. But if there are some of these where the shader size does not seem to be the thing that is, is causing a, a lower frame rate, then I would be interested in knowing what, what's the reason for that. So I came out uh, with this other uh, chart, which compares, uh, I, I removed a lot of the shaders in here because they were not very interesting. They were very similar results. And I wanted to see here which ones are the, the, the ones that have the worst uh, or, or the, the biggest difference in the shader instruction size. And compare that with the previous results to identify if there is any other of those other benchmarks that is uh, being that is being impacted for some other reason. So if we look here, for example, effect 2D-2, has a pretty big difference, and that's uh, that's that's one that I went to to look into, and then I found out about the texture swizzling thing. There's probably more data that we can obtain from from this choice, but that's still work to be done. So going forward from here, uh, one of the things that we have today is that there are not many issues in GitLab, and I don't know what to take from this information. Maybe there are no bugs left, and maybe everyone's happy, or maybe people are not reporting the issues, or I don't know exactly what's the reason here. Um, so there is there is not much um, recorded backlog on, on, on what to do. We could do more performance work, for example, based on the benchmark that I, I showed before. We could do more work on, on improving the compilers, maybe some general improvements. I do have a series of, of patches that enable harder performance counters. It's just not merged yet because it has some impact on the kernel uh, ABI, which doesn't have space currently, and you have to change that. Um, doesn't have space for the performance counters. So 
that's something you still need to evaluate. But there, there also didn't seem to be much interest in in that. So, I, what I believe at this point is that we would really need more community feedback, more issues being filed if people are still hitting any issues. Uh, otherwise we will just work on random things that may not affect. And then going back to the applications that still make the GPU relevant, maybe you should uh, work on that, but it would be great if people would continue to report if there are still any issues that, that they have in particular with, with those applications. And this is the end of my presentation. Here are some links to the documentation, our mailing list, and our uh, IRC channel on OFTC. There, there are always people on the channel um, there are people on different time zones, but if you if you stay there for for long enough, someone will uh, reply to you. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Heidi KR asks, how much testing has been done on the GL applications, either through native GL or GL for ES? Honestly, I, I don't know that. I believe many applications are still using the same builds that are used for desktop, so they could just be using the, the GL side. I don't know if anyone, I, I think nobody's using GL for ES because you, you do have both GL and GLES from the um, MESA compatibility layer. But I, I don't I don't have data on how much, how, how many people use GL or GLES specifically. Okay, and it looks like that's it for questions for this talk then. Thank you very much for the talk again, and uh, have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you for watching.